Hi there. Welcome to Chatroom 18, your bonus episode on Scrolls and Leaves. Just a quick programming note. This is the last in our series of chat rooms. Thanks so much for listening. Do stay tuned for season one. It's coming up soon. Getting back to our bonus episode today, we'll be talking to an Indian cartoonist who's one of the only artists to draw the history of Indian science. My name is Orghu Manna and I am a cartoonist. So there is a Y in my name, but during secondary examination, the government lost the Y. So I didn't go to the court and didn't correct it. So it's actually Argya. Argya used to be a scientist researching cancer, but he now lives in Howrah, West Bengal, working as a journalist. But his real passion is after hours, drawing comics. Argya runs a blog called Drawing the History of Science, And he's artistically collaborated with the University of Oslo, the Heidelberg Center for Transcultural Studies, the University of Exeter, and his comic on the transmission of COVID-19 was chosen as one of the best of 2020 by the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, which is a world-renowned medical journal. And amazingly, Argya is self-taught. We chatted last month while we were all huddled indoors like cloistered monks hiding out from covid Our chat has been edited and condensed. You'll hear about famine in colonial Bengal and Arya's approach to depicting it in comics. British systematically actually destroyed the peasant society and then the artisans. One by one, the East India Company destroyed every social layer, every economic layer. India's indigenous graphic novelists, called Pata Chitrakars, who first draw their art and then sing it. <laughs> Argya's artistic process. Whatever is the day, it's bad or good. I have any commissioned work or not. I have a routine to sit on my desk. And how Indian artisans contributed to Western science. The indigenous knowledge was the shoulder on which the modern science is standing. This is chat room 18, a drawing the history of Indian science. I'm Mary Rose Abraham. And I'm Guy Three Vaidinathan. We have a small request. We are an independently funded podcast, so if you like what you're hearing, why not consider donating? Details on our website, scrollsandleaves.com. Okay, let's start at the height of action. In 1767, on the banks of the Hooghly River at Palashi, near Calcutta, the British East India Company defeats the Indian Nawab and takes over Bengal. It's a defining moment. After this, the entire subcontinent, that's modern-day Myanmar, India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan, will fall to the British. Two years after the war, in 1769, the Great Bengal Famine begins, one of many to come. The history of colonial India is scattered with famine and mass casualties. Ten million people died in this one. There's a project at the University of Exeter in the UK called Famine Tales, which explores the cultural history of famine in India and Britain. The scholars have assembled an archive on famine, accessible to everyone online. And last year, the team invited Argya and five other artists to pick material from the archive and interpret it visually. When you go to the internet and search visual about famine in India, You will see pictures by Sunil Jana during the partition, or the artwork by Chitta Prashad Bhattacharya, or the artwork by Somna Thor or Jayanul Abidin. They are the prolific artists who documented famine during partitions and Second World War. And all of these artworks were about human suffering, dead bodies on the road. From the very beginning, I was very certain that I will not repeat that. So I wanted to create something new, but I was at the time really very confused. So, Arkya and his collaborator, Deep Kumar Mitra of the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad, turned to a book called The Annals of Rural Bengal, written by William Hunter in 1868. That's a century after the Great Bengal Famine. So, Hunter was a East India Company official. He is a civil servant in Bengal, posted in Birbhum district in Shuri. And he was, from his heart, was a historian, not a government employee. So he wanted to document history of Bengal village through the lens of famine because when he visited India, another famine was happening in Odisha in 1867 or 70s. At that time, Odisha, Bihar and in Madras, Madras famine happened in late 19th century. 
So there are several famines in the later half of the 19th century. What Hunter did, he experienced that famine as a first person. And he actually wrote a history of a famine 100 years before. Argya and Deep Kumar studied the text for nine months, but were still confused. What we should draw, what would be our central attraction in our story. And at that point, Argya turned to a more contemporary expert on famine, Amritya Sen, an economist at Harvard University. So I was really moved by the book written by Professor Amartya Sen in 1981. It was Poverty and Famine. It was a classic and later he got Nobel Prize also in economic science. So in this book, Professor Shen challenged is a concept of an index called FAD, which food availability decline. Before him, every famine historian or famine researcher or economist used to use that index to define a famine, the food availability decline. But Shen challenged that concept. He actually brought various layers like the political turmoils, the role of the government, And many other things like how the peasant society was working, how the artisanal society was working at the time and the economic pyramid in the society. There are many layers how a famine could happen. It is just not scarcity of rain and famine habit. So availability of food is also dependent on the transport of food. Like some a section of people is siphoning food or food grain from the greater section of society, then famine could happen also. So this different multi-layer concept uh, Professor Shen brought in his book. Then I thought, okay, so let's follow his trail because he's the most trusted guy defining famine in the world. So let, let's define that Bengal famine through Professor Shen's lens. So we studied how at the time the economic pyramid was, the transaction between peasants and the jamindars and other sections of the societies like Nawabs and Delhi. So I created a map how the economic transition happened. Then I thought if you block the transport of food from one area to another area, so one area can fall into the famine condition. So I studied the transport system. Bengal, there was many rivers and water bodies in Bengal. So boat system was the main transport system. So I studied that. And before the Great Bengal Famine, the British had increased taxation of peasants drastically and pushed them to grow cash crops such as indigo or poppy to be exported for the opium trade. Peasants were deep in debt. Then I thought, okay, so how the peasant society was behaving and British systematically actually destroyed the peasant society. Okay, their their integrity, they destroyed it. And then the artisans, the one by one, the East India Company destroyed every social layer, every economic layer. So then when uh, late 1767, there was a scarcity of rain, famine happened. And the graphic novel that Argus made is quite a unique treatment of all this. It'll be released by the University of Exeter next month. We'll update you on our Instagram when it's out. Argya says that artists from Bengal, from a village called Naya, were also part of the Famine Tales project. They're called Pata Chetrakars, and they're the indigenous graphic novelists of India. It's a kind of amalgamation of illustration and the performing art. So they first illustrate the story on a silk or a piece of cloth. It's a huge artwork, 8 feet, 10 feet, or 12 feet, or more than that piece of cloth. The Chetrakars will show you the drawings. In parallel, they will sing. It's, it's a fascinating experience. Here's a clip of five artists performing the Krishna Leela. A story of love between Radha and Krishna. The artists are Manimala Chitrakar, Rani Chitrakar, Prabir Chitrakar, Malik Chitrakar, and Baharjan Chitrakar. So, before drawing, Argya puts in months of research, and the final magic happens at his desk. We wanted to know about him, where he draws, how he's coping with COVID. I really do not have any separate studio. So I have a working desk uh, here in my apartment. It's a little bit messy. Like there are lots of pen, inks, uh, pencils here. I'm an old style guy. I just love drawing on paper. But before starting that, I used to think for hours sitting quietly on my desk. So I draw on paper, mostly uh, on my desk. 
and I scan it. Uh, I color them using Photoshop or hand drawn color like watercolor, acrylic, and pastels. Whatever is the day, it's bad or good. Uh, I have any commissioned work or not. I have a routine to sit uh, on my desk. It's kind of a routine. I every day I sit in the chair in front of my desk and I think. Then I start start drawing. Or sometimes I. Uh, watch some videos from masters uh, artists work i love really love i watch their videos their interviews to season myself before i start drawing and that's a great practice so who are the masters who inspire you since i'm a cartoonist my favorite cartoonist is joe sacco joe sacco is a comics journalist actually single handedly he created this field uh, comics journalism is a famous author of Palestine. He used to love to work in conflict zones, very different from my work. And since I love history, there are two artists. One is a Chinese contemporary artist, is Sun Sun. I really love his drawing. He loves to depict the cultural evolution from China and the, what is happening in China. I think he's one of the best artists who actually can portray history through his art. His work is very true, very honest. I really want to follow his trail, but still I am searching or uh, I would say I am experimenting how can I bring his style or the philosophy in, in drawing science or science history. And my all-time favorite artist is William Kentridge from South Africa. Uh, his famous work is related to Einstein theory of time. I also love his uh, drawings from apartheid. They are my biggest inspirations. And how has COVID affected your work? How are you coping? As an artist, I want to be more expressive. In the last year, we saw a disastrous scenario about migrant workers. I really wanted to do something big on that piece, but I couldn't do that. Like at that time, I didn't really didn't have any resources. I was locked down in my room. I was running out of my art material. So uh, I would say the COVID situation, the tension, uh, I, have a, uh, I have a kid in my home, so I'm also tensed. So the the what kind of drawing I drawing I want to produce, the artwork I want to produce, I cannot do that. Arya has been looking more and more into the contributions of Indian knowledge to scientific thought. His city, after all, was at the center of colonial science in India. Uh, so in colonial India, the Calcutta was the center. So that's why I'm also very much interested. It's my city also, just three miles away from my home. <laughs> I want to dig out science in the colonial Kolkata in my city. So there are many unknown figures. Their histories are buried in the archives of Asiatic society and other uh, local archives. So now I am more confident about my experiment drawing history and science. So now I think I can portray these unknown figures. The layer I am most interested uh, is the role of the artisan. Uh, in developing science, that's the indigenous knowledge practice. But even in the Europe, the artisans actually were the early scientists. So there is a book called The Body of the Artisans. It was written by Pamela Smith. And so the concept is that in the early modern Europe, the blacksmiths, the goldsmiths, the metal workers, or the painters, the color makers, pigment makers, they knew the science and the alchemists. So they were the artisans, who were the makers in society, the philosophers, the elite people, they got their recipes and converted that recipes into modern science. But actually it was started from the local knowledge. So in Calcutta, it was also true. There were early printmakers and the metal workers in Bengal, a very diverse culture of the artisanal practice who, who dealt with the stones, how to make things from stones and the various metals. The weavers, they knew the science behind how to produce silk. So in this way, the indigenous knowledge was the actual shoulder on which the modern science is standing. So I'm still researching on that. And due to COVID, to report this kind of story, you need to travel, right? But now travel is banned. So I'm just sitting and waiting and reading materials from archives and planning. So I hope uh, in near future, I can finish this project. Finally, there's something I've been curious about. There just aren't that many illustrations in ancient Indian signs. Take Ayurveda, for example. The earliest known image is the Ayurvedic man, an illustration from the 17th century. 
And if you think that's rather recent for Ayurveda, a science that is thousands of years old, you'd be right. So I asked Arkia why scientific illustrations are such a new thing in India. I have a two theories in my mind. One theory is dominated by what European historians said already. Even in Europe, in the beginning, art was not very much used in conveying science or documenting science. One historian actually blamed Pliny, the great Roman historian and the scholars, because at that time, art was a very ephemeral thing. So at that time, the color people used was from the natural resources like flowers, and the grasses and the pigments from other chemicals, the yellow pigments from the urine also. So the drawing was not permanent. Scholars told that since the art is the ephemeral thing, it is not necessary or adequate to convey science. So it's have to be written in prose, in words. Later, when the printing technology was developed, so art became permanent. So there is a beautiful term used by Bruno Latour the famous historian, French historian, it's immutable mobile. When the printing technology came, the words and the drawing became immutable and it became mobile. So through printed books in the early modern period, the science with illustrations actually traveled all around the world. Then it became permanent because people knew that, okay, now it's not a female. Now it's going to stay. Then again, in Italian Renaissance, some artwork created by Leonardo and in Germany, uh, Albrecht Durer, they created some beautiful stuff and it influenced the latter generation a lot. So then art became an important part of conveying science. And what about India? India in the early period, the culture of knowledge propagation in our country, in India or the greater Asia was through the oral knowledge, like in Mahabharata and Ramayana also, it was not written for the many years. Just like that, there are many versions of old medicine text and the other scientific texts also, because it was not written, it was not printed, of course. So they really didn't use drawings. Later, when they started documenting, again, Pliny's philosophy was also there. Just reminding you that Pliny's position was that art is too ephemeral to be used for documentation purposes. So the Silk Root, the philosopher of Greece, Asia Minors, and the India, they are all connected. And it's my theory that they actually practiced similar kind of philosophies. Like drawing is like you are observing nature uh, in front of your eyes, which we can see in front of our eyes is not real. So this kind of philosophical concepts was practiced in the Asia and the Greece and the Rome, and the Europe also through the Silk Root. So they really didn't document it on paper, what they see. They actually tried to understand it. They tried to write about it uh, in poems, uh, not in prose even. Like our uh, old texts are in, uh, written in poems, the slokes. So that's why in the ancient period, there was no documentation of scientific illustrations. But I think that story, this picture is not complete because... Again, what we think about scientific illustrations is through the lens of the Western science, like illustrating a scientific piece just opposed to the text in a book, in printed form or in a hand, hand-drawn manuscript. But perhaps at that time, in many cultures, they conveyed scientific thoughts through tapestry or something written on a wall or in temples. Like in Angkor Wat, there are many temples that there are pictures of trees and the herbs are inscribed on the wall. Also, I saw again in internet the Bayeux tapestry in France. That This is a century-old tapestry from the Middle Ages. People really documented solar system and, and other stars, movement of stars and comets. So I think at that time, the tapestry and the picture in the temples, church, sculpture, we need to look into that, why people really created that. So these are also scientific illustration or scientific art. These are the different mode. I think we haven't understood it completely and we are just focusing on the picture drawn on the paper, just like we modern people are doing. But at that time, the artistic practice to convey science was more diverse and we are uh, yet to understand it.
You are listening to Argyamana on Chatroom 18 on Scrolls and Leaves. For more information and other episodes, visit scrollsandleaves.com or follow us on Twitter at Scrolls Leaves, Instagram at Scrolls and Leaves, or like us on Facebook. Do stay tuned for Season 1. It's coming up soon. See you then.